So I would like to introduce uh, Kasim Aslam from Solutions 8. Um, I actually have his book sitting here right in front of me. Really, really exciting um, material here that he shares in his book. So um, you can see here that the topic of our webinar today is of the same name. So he's going to share some really, really good um, effective digital marketing practices with you today. My name is Kasim. It rhymes with awesome because my dad wanted me beat up in high school. And uh, I wrote a book called The Seven Critical Principles of Effective Digital Marketing. Um, it's going to be followed up by uh, how to write the most annoying book titles ever. And uh, the, the premise of the book is built around the fact that digital marketing is always changing. And that's actually, I mean, it's kind of a running cliche in our industry now. Uh, you wake up and, you know, the Google algorithm has changed. The Facebook targeting mechanism has changed. The two people that use Bing have gone to Europe. And, and we're constantly being placed in an environment where we need to pivot and uh, keep up with this just, just ever-changing environment. And so one of the questions I was asking myself, because I actually built this for me internally, for my staff before, before I ever wrote the book, was uh, I wanted to know what are the constants. And I wanted to try to find those constants and then put them in a bottle. So when we bring on new folks and onboard clients, that, that we have some guiding light that kind of helps us the, you know, act as a foundation for our digital marketing strategies. And that's where the book came from. Um, a little edification, if you don't mind. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Solutions 8. We are, of course, uh, Infusionsoft certified partners, one of the best decisions I've ever made for my business. Um, that's a little bit of pandering, but mostly just plain truth. Um, love these guys, love what they do, and I'm just really grateful to have been involved. Uh, we're digital marketer certified partners, also something that I just um, uh, really, really proud of, and again, really grateful to have been involved with these guys. If you're not, if you haven't been exposed to digital marketers content, it's really worth looking into. They tie into Infusionsoft really well. As a matter of fact, a lot of the digital marketer products are built specifically for Infusionsoft because Ryan Dice uh, uses Infusionsoft, him and his staff. And we're also Google partners, and I bring this up just because I want you guys to know sort of you know where my my expertise comes. Comes from. I think it helps contextualize what it is I'm about to say. My AdWords staff is in the top 3% of all uh, Google partners for performance and customer care. So when it comes to lead generation, we just kill it. Um, and again, I'm not trying to sound arrogant or anything. I just, I sort of want to position myself in a way that lets you know uh, where we approach our digital marketing strategies, because I think that'll, um, A, let you know where my strengths are, and B, maybe inform you as to where some of my blind spots are. Before I jump into the session, I just want to say that I think this can be super collaborative. Um, as a matter of fact, I think I'm going to be able to provide you with more value if you guys give me the opportunity to contextualize what I'm saying against like your questions or specific use cases or whatever. So if as I'm diving into this, you have a question or idea or a comment or you want me to apply what I'm saying, you know, apply a little specificity and, and you have a case study, fire it off. I think we can get collaborative. If uh, we don't have the time or if I don't understand the question, I'm just going to pretend like I didn't see it. But otherwise, I'd love to, uh, I'd love to get some feedback. Uh, I think that'll just make this more, more valuable for everybody. Um, I am doing a breakout session at Icon. I have the worst time ever. Somebody over there hates me. It's Tuesday at 6 when everybody's going to be out grabbing drinks. But if you show up to my breakout session, which is on advanced Facebook marketing, I'm going to give you a free copy of my book. And that's a free hard copy, not a Kindle copy, because that's a bait and switch. And I don't like when people do that. So that's my one little plug, and I'm never going to bring it up again. So sorry, forgive me. Now, let's dive into the principles. I have the definition of principle up here, not that anybody really needs to know what it is, but uh, what I'd like to refresh um, everyone on is the fact that these are supposed to be um, foundational. They don't change. So th these aren't tactics. These aren't things that you know, we do while they work. Hopefully, these are things that we build everything that we do on from a digital marketing perspective. And digital marketing is different. It's a different type of approach. It's a different paradigm than, than normal and traditional marketing. And that's true because the power is in the consumer's hands almost entirely. 77% uh, of the purchase decision is made before they're ever willing to reach out to a vendor. So that means 77% of everything that's going to happen in relation to your product service is, is uh done without you. It's done because we have an educated consumer base that has access to just a massive amount of information on your industry, your competitors, on you specifically. And so what we need to do is we need to position ourselves to be influences without being uh, uh, constantly present. And I think the way to do that is through um, proper principles. You may be aware that I stole the format of my um, book. Uh, Karen's asking for a source. I'm going to get that to you. I think that's Rossiter & Co, by the way, but that's actually in my book, so I'll, I'll, I'll chat the source um, as soon as I'm able to page through that. 
Stephen Covey's one of my personal heroes. Uh, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People kind of changed my life. And I didn't intentionally steal his title right off the bat. I actually split tested 30 different titles. And the one that I have is just what, what performed the best. But Covey wrote his book um, because of what he saw as a flaw in success literature. He says that uh, around the turn of the First World War, he saw a massive shift in um, the state and nature of success literature in that prior to World War I, and these are Covey's words, not mine, but prior to World War I, um, people spoke to character ethic. And character ethic uh, refers to things like truth, justice, honor, integrity, courage, temperance, self-reliance. It's all the stuff your mom told you about. It's all that stuff that we kind of give a lot of lip service to, um, but you know, we don't necessarily work uh, to build on an ongoing basis, and I'm, this isn't an accusation or anything, but uh, just you know, just to say that, that there are things that can take a back seat in our day-to-day -day narrative. And he says that after World War II, we, we, or World War One, excuse me, we switched over to personality ethic. And you know, personality ethic, it's things like you know, hey, pretend you're interested in, in what somebody else is interested in, so you can get them to like you. I'm going to pick on Dale Carnegie a little bit. I know a lot of people are really big Dale Carnegie fans. I think Carnegie hit personality ethic way too hard. Um, you know, it's, it's things like when you smile at people, it will, there's neural associations associated with smiling. And if they see you smile when you first see them, then you're going to build a neural association that you're a positive influence in their life. Or when you shake somebody's hand, if you shake overhand, you're assuming a position of dominance. These are things that maybe they're true. I don't know, but I, I, I don't see a, a character ethic merit to them. You speak to somebody, you're interested in what they're talking about because you're interested in them as a person. Because, you know, I mean, we share a, a, a common human experience, and that's the character ethic thing there is, is empathy and love uh, and understanding. Instead of, I want something from you, and so I'm going to pretend or play or, or pander or, or position myself in order to receive. And this is what we do with digital marketing. It's, it's a plague in our industry. And again, I'm not trying to be accusatory. It's really hard for me to come at this without being a little bit negative, but um, we have a really bad habit, and I think a lot of it comes from good intentions, but we have a really bad habit of thinking that our consumer base, they're just a bunch of lemmings. And if we can press the but right buttons in the right ways, that we can lead them down this channel, and then they'll just come off in droves and buy from us. And it's not true. I'm going to give you one really specific example. It's my favorite example of all time. Um, this comes from Syndicast. And this is from 2014, and I, I, I actually talk about them in my book a little bit, but they came out in 2014, and they said that using the word video in an email subject line boosts open rates by 19%, click-through rates by 65%, and reduces unsubscribes by 26%. And this was over, I think, 18 months and a couple hundred thousand emails. And they had a lot of data points like this. And I, and I use this one because it's, it's so ridden with personality ethic, it's almost not funny. And we, we see things like this all of the time. If you're a digital marketer, and if you're in the digital marketing space, I, I promise you see this daily, and it's become white noise almost. We're, we're so acclimated to it, we don't even notice it. But what's absurd about this is the fact that people have some strange visceral response to the word video, which isn't true. What this really means from a character ethic standpoint, this means that people want to watch. They want to watch a, a video because they think that videos as media are higher quality. And I bet you before this statistic was publicized, that was probably true. Because when they, I knew that, hey, if you have a video in your email, that means that I'm going to have a slightly higher quality uh, uh, type of media that I can engage with faster. After something like this happens, and you'll see this happen all the time, there's a gold rush on it. And marketers do what marketers do, which is destroy it. And so you get every single marketer on the planet saying, wow, we need to produce videos so we can use the word video in our subject line. Instead of, we need to produce videos that are high quality because it's obvious that people respect that form of media and they want to engage with that. After this was published in 2014, these numbers went, they, they plummeted. And video started to hurt the efficacy of an email. Um, which, again, was actually really, another really, really interesting case study Syndicast put out, and they called themselves on it, which I, which I appreciated and liked. But I think it speaks to the way that we treat our markets. Uh, the word video isn't what's important. It's, it's what people are interested in, how they want to engage. And again, we do this often. I promise you, if you open up your email right now today, you're going to see somebody sending you, you know, data points, case studies, references, etc. And they, they have it packaged in a personality ethic uh, paradigm, and we need to take that packaging off, and we need to look at the character ethic and really start to dive into why, why those things work, why they feel that way, what people are thinking, doing, etc. So, with that said, I'm going to dive into the seven critical principles. Am, am I on track with everybody so far? Am I going too fast? Are we all on board? Just a little validation. Awesome. Great. Thanks, guys. 
Now, I'm going to go over the first three principles on this call just because seven is too much to cover. Um, the first three, I think, are the, the, the most important. I, I split them up into what I call paradigm principles and process principles. So principles one, two, and three are paradigm principles. These are the principles that should influence the way you see your marketing, the way you perform, the way you function, the way you train your employees. If you work for an agency, the way that, that uh, you do your work, this is the foundation. This is the, the bedrock that you're building on top of. The process principles are principles only when they're built on the first three principles. If you remove those first three principles, the process principles become tactics. Uh, and that's really important for me to say, especially because I'm not going to be going over the process principles. Um, but they're, they're just they're secondary to the paradigm principles, which is what we're going to touch on today. The very first of the paradigm principles is empathize. And honestly, if this is all you ever take away from this call, uh, I think you're, you're a step ahead of the vast majority of all marketers. Now, empathy is a touchy-feely word that we talk about in the second grade and we never bring back to the forefront. What's interesting about it, though, is I think it's the single most important skill that a marketer can have, and it's something that we need to hone on an ongoing basis. And, and empathy is natural. Empathy is a part of the human condition. As a matter of fact, we have a word for people without empathy, and it's sociopath. Uh, we all have it, hopefully, and we all use it on a regular basis. But for some reason, when we get into the boardroom and we start whiteboarding stuff and talking strategy, empathy takes a back seat. And, and then we start doing things like, wow, you know, I wonder what color people, this demographic responds to better. And which of these images do you think is going to perform more effectively? And, and we, we, we go immediately go left-brained, analytical. And what I'd like to do is not set that aside. That's important, but it needs to live on top of empathy. What do people want? What do they care about? What do, what, do they, what do they hope for? What do they dream? What are they afraid of? What scares them? What excites them? Uh, you know, what time of the day is best to engage with them? When, when, when is your demographic going to be tired or hungry or sad or anxious or eager? The more you can approach your marketing from a position of empathy, the more effective you're going to be. And I'm going to give you some specific, uh, pardon the word, but specific tactics to do that. Um, and actually some specific examples. So one of the things that I like to ask myself with, with uh, empathy as a paradigm is if this, then what? And what's really interesting about this and what's really exciting is you can make some awesome connections that seemingly have nothing to do with each other. I'll give you a really specific example. This is something that we did for a client. We ran a, a digital marketing campaign for a life insurance company. Um, the life insurance company didn't have a very well-defined vertical or target. And as you know in digital marketing, uh, defining a specific vertical and defining a specific target is, uh, is paramount. It's critical. So one of the things that we did is, is we went after um, new parents. And from an empathic standpoint, we got together and we decided that new dads are afraid to die. And I know that sounds like a really kind of morbid uh, comment, but that's, this is, those are the exact words that we had written up on the whiteboard. And it was after a couple hours of just chatting, um, chatting with you know, previous customers, uh, a few prospects who were willing to getting on the phone with us for a focus group, some of the salespeople. And they, we found out that a lot of the people that were buying life insurance were new parents, specifically fathers, who were now afraid that, you know, gosh, if something happens to me, I want to make sure my family's covered. Now, this sounds a little predatory, and I just have to stop here. Empathy needs to come from a, from a positive place. So we need to know that we're providing a solution that is going to help, not hurt. We don't want to prey on people's fears. But I think it's okay to use that fear as your gateway in as long as the solution you're providing is a positive one. And so what we did is we started to target new fathers with life insurance. Now, if you think new fathers and life insurance, those two things from a demographic standpoint usually don't go together. But again, approaching it from a paradigm of empathy, they make perfect sense. I'll give you example number two. Oh, let me see what Karen said. Good agencies such as Chia Day. Love it. Gold plus land equals prepper. So we have a, 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 a precious metals commodity broker who sells bullion, numismatic coins, etc. And again, he didn't have an exceptionally well-targeted vertical. Well, what we found after you know, empathizing and, and going through kind of the focus group process that we go through is a lot of the people that are purchasing numismatic coins and bullion are people thinking that think that the dollar is going to collapse or that there's an issue with the fiat currency or that you know they need to be secured beyond what uh, you know stocks and bonds can can secure for them and so what we did is we utilized content uh, in order to determine who 
A, you can target people that are landowners, specifically landowners with water rights. Uh, that's a list that we can buy, and then we uploaded it to a Facebook custom audience. Um, but we, we used content to try to find people that are preppers, people that are interested in things like heirloom seeds and how to plant them, um, you know, how to, how to make water last longer. The easy, we had one article that was, you know, seven, seven water pur purification tactics that, uh, or materials that are in your house right now, and one of them is gasoline. You put a drop of gasoline in a gallon of water, I guess it cleans it. Don't take my word for that. I'm a marketer. Um, not a water purification expert. Um, but we had somebody who was, and they helped us write this content. Now, you would never think water purification and gold or water purification and self-directed IRA. Those two things don't connect. But again, using our empathic powers, we're able to look at this and build that narrative. And so we decided people that own land, which is our target, um, that was the fence that we, we drew. And then we qualified those people against prepper content. That plus that sold gold. Um, and, and what's really interesting about this is you could use any equation here. If you're selling land, then go find uh, preppers that buy gold. If you're um, looking for preppers, find people that are, that are buying gold and own land. Th that's the, the equation we came up with with this specific avatar. And it's not the only equation. It's just what works for us. Another example, dentists are liars. Uh, this is one of my favorite. This is actually one that we did for another digital marketing agency. They focus uh, specifically on dentists, and they had a really hard time going after dentists on Facebook. Well, what we found out, and again, this is, it's all just sitting around talking to people who engage with these dentists often, but dentists get market, marketed to on an ongoing basis, um, I mean, to tedium, because everybody's going after dentists, Every, because dentists are, are um, they have a lot of money, and they do really well, and they're an easy business to articulate, and an easy business to market. Um, there, there are digital marketing firms, there's a plethora of them that focus purely in the dental vertical. So dentists are hard to find, but here's what we figured out, is on Facebook and LinkedIn, Dentists don't call themselves dentists. They don't list their, their title as dentists because they don't want people to know that they're dentists for obvious reasons because jerks like me are out trying to find them. So when we figured that out, and again, this isn't, this isn't, there's no data that tells you this. Uh, it's, it's, it's an empathic decision with data-driven support. So once we figured that out, then we started looking at things like, well, what would a dentist be interested in? And there were uh, certain equipment providers, medical equipment providers, and there were certain organizations and in, in, in kind of dental union type things uh, that we were able to use as publications. And the minute we added those to our interest-based segmentation of Facebook, we found ourselves a whole plethora of dentists, where before you would, you would be convinced that they didn't exist. Um, within Facebook and LinkedIn for targeting. So using your powers of empathy, you're going to be able to find and speak to people in a way that you can't otherwise. And you have to get creative. The big bonus I have to offer you here, and something that has truly changed our ability to target, is to use content to qualify. Here's what's really interesting. Your content doesn't need to be related to your product or service. So I'm, I'm a digital marketing agency. We're looking for, for organizations that do uh, anywhere between one and $20 million a year in gross profit. I need to create content that speaks to that avatar. It doesn't yet have to say anything about digital marketing. I just need, I, I, you know, we can say things about cost savings or managerial procedures or project management or which SaaS product worked better for a, a manufacturing organization or how, you know, this, this design build organization was able to accomplish these things. And the minute they engage with that content, I now know, oh, you're in my demographic. And then I get to segment them and, and follow up um, with digital marketing content. So you can find people using content, and that content doesn't need to be related to your product or service. It just needs to help you identify who they are. And the more you know about them, the better, which is a perfect segue, if I do say so myself, to an avatar builder. This is the very first thing that you need to do when you're running any digital marketing campaign ever. This is critical. And again, this is the type of thing that just gets a massive amount of lip service. People do it for the first 45 minutes when you onboard a new client and then you walk away. If you're marketing in any capacity for yourself or for other people, you need to build customer avatars. And by the way, you're not just going to have one avatar. You, you might have two, you might have 50. An avatar is not a demographic. A demographic is a group of people. An avatar is one person. It's an idealized version of who it is you're tackling. So one of our verticals for a really long time was naturopathic physicians. And what we found after looking at the naturopaths we were working with is we actually had two avatars. There was Dr. Mike. Dr. Mike was uh, in his late 40s, early 50s, uh, very sophisticated, very intelligent, afraid of the Internet, and he wanted to retire. 
So he was looking to streamline his practice to a degree that allows him to systematize and then ultimately sell or bring on a junior partner who can run it. Then there was Dr. Jenny. Dr. Jenny's in her late 20s, early 30s. She didn't have a ton of money. She's fresh out of school, but she was really motivated to do um, cutting-edge digital marketing practices. She was, she was all about content. She understood things. She, quote, unquote, got it. Those are two entirely different avatars, right? Like those two people couldn't be more different, and yet they're in the same demographic. So when you're working to empathize, it's really important to make sure that you understand who, what, which avatars make up your target demographic? Because naturopathic position is one demographic. Dr. Mike and Dr. Jenny are two different people. They go different places. They play different games. They read different articles. They engage differently online. They're entirely different folks. So when you're building your segmentation in Infusionsoft, make sure you're building them against your avatars. And by the way, I stole this from Digital Marketer, and I'm a huge Digital Marketer fanboy. You guys have to forgive me. I drank the Kool-Aid. I would cuddle with Ryan Dice if he let me. So I'm going to refer to their stuff a lot. But um, I got a little link to their, their avatar sheet down there. Spend some time. Do your avatar sheet. So I'm going to say something kind of touchy-feely again, and you guys have to forgive me. You're not going to effectively market to somebody until you fall in love with them. And I know some of you might have chuckled or rolled your eyes or whatever, but I really believe this, kind of to the core of my being. You can't not love someone after you get to know them. I believe that. Um, you want to know your avatar so much that you love them. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, uh, the, the way a husband loves a wife or anything. I just mean the, the, the way that I think that you're going to love anybody once you understand their hopes, their dreams, their wants, their needs, their desires, their fears, their struggles. You need to dive that deep. And once you dive that deep, you're going to be positioned to speak to them in a way that they're going to respond to. And that's why empathy is so critical. Any questions about empathy before I jump over to principle number two? Nope. Moving on. Principle number two. This is one where we all get at least 33% right. Learn, apply, and innovate. Digital marketing is scary. Infusionsoft can be scary. It's such an awesome tool. It's so strong in so many ways and can do so many things for us. Sometimes it's really easy to kind of bury our head in the sand and not pay attention to what's being changed. And, you know, sometimes we do it consciously. Sometimes we do it unconsciously, though, because if I don't know that a change has been made, then I don't necessarily have to adjust myself to it. And what I'd rather see everybody do is build processes that safeguard you against that, because if we don't pay attention, then what's going to happen is you're going to wake up 18 months from now and you're going to be obsolete in your business, regardless of what your business is. So we have really, I think, strong systems built in our organization for this. Uh, as a matter of fact, every member of my staff is required to create what we call five minutes of value every single week. So we have a Friday morning meeting, and everybody presents their five minutes of value. And the five minutes of value just means that it's a piece of content that can be engaged with within five minutes, and it's something new or exciting or interesting. And all it does is it just keeps you um, focused on finding and seeking out that information when you do find it bottling it. So it's not hard. It's not cumbersome. It's not, you know, cost prohibitive. It's just the type of thing that, that keeps you, um, your, your finger to the pulse. Here's my formula. And this is what I would love to see everybody adopt. Spend 10 minutes a day on something small. That's an article, a video, a podcast, something small, but make sure that, that the value that you can glean is, is uh, done in 10 minutes. So don't, you know, listen to a 40, 10 minutes of a 45-minute podcast and think you got it unless you're going to split up one, one podcast over four days. Um, try to walk away with a takeaway, I guess is what I'm saying, after 10 minutes. Spend one hour a week on something medium-sized. So, you know, read a white paper or a blog or, or take a tutorial and spend four hours a month on something big. Read a book or an e-book, take a course. What this equates to is about 12 hours per month. There's 4.3, 4, 4 5, uh, weeks in a month etc. We can all do the math. So 12 hours a month isn't an insurmountable long amount of time. Now it's tax relevant. You know, I mean, we have, to, we have to build this into our processes and systems and procedures. But if you can do this, what it does is it gives you the opportunity to stay cutting edge. Um, and cutting edge is just such an annoying term. All I really mean is stay up to date. The stuff that you're learning isn't even necessarily stuff that you need to learn today or you know, implement today. It's just things that you need to be cognizant of or aware of. Oh, this change was made. I wonder how that's going to impact things. Let me sit on it for a while, and we'll wait and see. Um, the application of what you're learning, so the, the learn is the 33% that I think most of us get right. If you're on this webinar, you've already kind of qualified yourself as somebody who's open to new information. And here's a great example of content qualification, by the way. Uh, you guys have qualified yourself through the engagement of content. So if I was going to market to you, I now know things about you um, from an empathic viewpoint that I wouldn't know prior to. And a good marketer can use that. The application of what you're learning is really important, and I think that's where a lot of us fall off. I'm horrible at this. 
I love to learn. I love to read. I love to watch. I love to do all that stuff. I love to talk, if you haven't noticed. Um, I'm not great at sitting down and saying, okay, now how do I use this? You know, I like the philosophy of it, but when it gets real tactile, that's actually a couple of the fellows that work for me, they're, they're way better at this than I am. And so they sort of um, take it and run with it. And I'm, I'm just so grateful to have them. But what we need to do is build a system from implementation. And you can build this in Infusionsoft, by, by the way. And Brad Martin, now over at Sixth Division, I think had a great uh, breakout session. I, I wasn't in it, but um, Stephen, uh, one of the Solutions 8 guys, um, told me about it. And um, we went over his notes. And I loved what Brad said about um, building systems from implementation so that you don't get derailed. And it doesn't need to be robust. It can be three sequences. So, you know, the, the very first one, it really depends on your industry. I would give you a template, but do an impact report and understand how this change or, or instance is going to impact everything you're doing. Uh, run a beta test and then cascade across the rest of your campaigns. That's a three-step system, and that could be your system for implementation. Again, it depends on your business and, and, and how you're approaching things, but have a system in place so that when you want to incorporate new things, you're not sort of shooting from the hip. You also want to keep a running list of priorities. Entrepreneurs all have ADD. I don't care what anybody says. I think that we are, we are clinically diagnosable. And every single time you hear, read, see, or, or encounter a new piece of information, you're going to get excited about it and you're going to want to implement it in your business. Keep a list. And if you have staff or, or strategic partners, include them on that. I like to use a Google Doc. Keep a list of the things that you want to do and keep it prioritized. Those priorities can move and change but they have to be in order. So what this does is it forces you to say, oh, you know what, this is the number two thing. And I'm gonna to continue to focus on my number one thing. My number one thing right now is my indoctrination campaign in Infusionsoft. And until that is done, all this other cool stuff that I wanna do, it's still cool, it's still important, it's gonna happen after that. If you keep a running list of prior priorities, it, it protects you from half-built bridges. And half-built bridges is something that I stole from Ryan Dice too. I'm not my own person, I'm just a, a six foot four Pakistani clone of Ryan. Um, but the half-built bridges is a talk he gives at the end of everything, every keynote he's ever done, if you've seen him. And the, the entire analogy is that you're standing on um, the precipice of a cliff. And the, the analogy for your business is that you're trying to build a bridge over to wherever it is that you want to be, whatever that end goal is for you. And each one of these tactics that we talk about, Infusionsoft is a great example. Let's say you want to build some campaigns for, in your Infusionsoft app. Um, that's a bridge. And you start to build that bridge and you start to make it about halfway across uh, this precipice um, and you're going to make it to where you want to go and then you get distracted and you're like, oh, wow, yeah, Facebook ads, that's really exciting. Um, Google, search engine optimization, content creation, we need a white paper, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you back up and you start building a new bridge. And if you look back, uh, especially for my longtime entrepreneurs, I've been in business for 11 years, so when I look back across my, my professional life, I have so many unfinished bridges. And what's sad about that is that they take all of your time, effort, energy, resources, et cetera. So build a bridge. When you start off, finish it. Stay dedicated to it and focused on it. Um, avoid half-built bridges at all costs. The very last one is innovate. And I'm going to try to speed this up because I think I'm taking too long. I apologize. To innovate, you need to go outside your industry. So if you're a dentist, stop looking at dental marketing all the darn time. It's okay to, to take a look at what your, what your com competitors are doing, but go look at what a veterinarian does or what an insurance broker does or you know, what a medical manufacturing plant does. You're going to get stuck in a content silo if you only pay attention to people in industry. The other thing that I like to do is, is called info sponging. It's something I stole from Jeff Hoffman, who's one of the co-founders of Priceline. Brilliant guy. I got to see him speak at uh, Digital Footprint. And one of the ideas he came up with, and ended up being a multi-million dollar idea, uh, came from an article he read in a Latino women's magazine. When he tried to buy the magazine at the airport kiosk, the lady almost didn't want to sell it to him. She kept saying, do you know what you're buying? And he's like, yeah, I know what I'm buying. And, and his entire point is, go get exposed to information you wouldn't otherwise be exposed to. Because that's when you're going to learn new things that you can apply to your industry. Everything in your industry is already readily available to you. You're not going to, you're not going to learn brand new things within the confines of your industry. You need to go out and do an outside-in approach. And the last piece of Innovate, is we need to play. Um, go make some mistakes. Have fun. Roll the dice. Throw some spaghetti against the wall and see what happens. Run a Facebook ad. Play with Snapchat. Try to figure it out. Uh, if you don't understand it, that's okay. Because, I mean, honestly, nobody's going to see your first couple ads anyway if you're not any good at it. So it's okay to fail. Digital marketing is built on failure. The very last one is give value first. This is something I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on because there's so much content written on about it already. But the point I would like to make is you're not a vending machine. You have zero loyalty to a vending machine. You give a vending machine a dollar, and it gives you your candy bar. And the day, the instant, there's a better vending machine that's closer or has a better selection or is one penny cheaper, then you're going to go to the brand new vending machine. 
we can't treat our businesses like vending machines. And a vending machine is transactional. If you give me your money, then I will cut your hair. That's a transactional relationship. Uh, and, and it's not just with purchases. If you give me your email, then I will give you my lead magnet. That is a transactional relationship, and you just turned yourself into a vending machine. Instead, what we want to do is, hey, here's some great content. Have it. And it, it stops people. Still, to this day, even with content saturation, people like when you look at – when you encounter really quality content, when you get something from somebody and you're like, man, this is awesome. This, this person answered my questions, and they didn't want anything for it. That's relationship building. You just earned trust. You just made a true, honest-to-goodness emotional deposit. And now that I've given you my free content and you're engaged and you're interested and you like me, now I can say, hey, if you give me an email, uh, I have a lead magnet that I think you'd really enjoy too. And I've already made a deposit. So asking for that makes it so much easier for me because I'm, I'm lockstepping my value. And then when I send you the lead magnet, I over-deliver. And I give you something that just blows you away again. And now, you're, now again, that's just another deposit. So uh, with the give value first paradigm, you're constantly giving more and more value, and you're walking them up this ascension ladder. And again, this isn't my model. This is from Digital Marketer. This is their customer value optimization model. I really recommend looking at this because this thing kind of changed my life a little bit. Um, we're not going to go over the process principles because we don't have enough time. But if you happen to pick up my book, by the way, it's on sale right now on uh, Amazon Kindle for 99 cents because I got, I got selected for a KDP offer. So you can pick it for a dollar. And I'd love for you to read it. I'd love to know what you think. I'd love to get a review from you. That said, I think we have, what, two minutes for questions? Um, and, and Braxton, do I turn this back over to you? Is everybody asleep? Oh, yeah, that's so good. <laughs> you can, yeah, if you need to. Um, yeah, we have a few minutes open. So, um, yeah, I think uh, let's open up for questions if we want to go that route. That'd be great. Anyone want to chat in with any questions at all? Or comments? <laughs> Anybody have like a specific business case that they're looking for? Or, uh, I don't know, an issue you're facing? Oh, man. Coslin's willing to be put on the spot, you guys. I would take advantage of it. <laughs> yeah, I'm all about that, actually. Trial by fire here. <laughs> Let's see. Great job doing Do clients get your book? Oh, here we go. What about products that come to market that are transactional in nature? Okay, so Martin, give me an example. What do you mean? What type of product are you looking at? So you're writing a book that's fiction. Okay, so this is a really good example. And this is actually, this is, I, I kind of got into a mini fight with somebody who read my book and said, hey, I had to pay for your book and I didn't get value up front. And my response to him was, well, you got to read the synopsis on Amazon, right? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, that, was, that in my mind is value. So really what I've been doing, and this isn't that big a deal, but I've been doing a video series. I call it my digital book tour. So if you hit up YouTube and you search for my name, uh, every single day I make a 10-minute video and I explain one of the core components of my book. And in my mind, that's value first. What we need to understand is even though a product is transactional in nature, the relationship doesn't have to be. So it's just all about how you canvas your connection with the consumer. Um, if I can provide value in some way, it doesn't have to be related to that product necessarily, then I'm going to build a relationship with you. And then when I do sell you a product, it's a relationship-based transaction. It's not a transactional relationship. Does that make sense? I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to talk my way out of this, but I feel like you can provide value even if it's not necessarily related to that product. Because I can't give you my book and then say, hey, please play for my book. But what I can do is I can do webinars like this one, or I can do uh, videos on YouTube that just have little, little tidbits and, and bite-sized bullets of value that people can take away and go, oh, yeah, I kind of like that guy. He talks too fast and he's an idiot, but I'll read his book. Um, <laughs> so in that way, I've given value up front, and then I'm positioned myself to make the ask, so to speak. Build a world around text. Treat the book as valuable to the compilation. I feel like I missed somebody here. Braxton, am I not moderating well? I'm sorry. No, you're fine. I, th I don't think you missed anything. Um, okay. Yeah. Let's see. But write a book. Build a world around the text. Treat the book as valuable due to the compilation of information that exists in the text. Yes. Yeah, that makes sense to me, I think. Absolutely. <clears throat> cool. All right, awesome. guys, any other questions at all? <laughs> One thing I really liked when you started out, Cossum, was um, just I, I admittedly have never um, read too much of Stephen Covey's stuff, but the whole dynamic and the, the dichotomy of character ethic versus 
uh, the personality ethic. I, just hearing you talk about that, it really opened my mind to realize like, that, you know, there's a different way to approaching things based on that kind of um, paradigm that I didn't even consider um, was at play in digital marketing. So that was something that just really opened my mind. It makes me excited to dive into your book a little bit more. Um, so thank you for that. Um, let's see here. Advertising to reach golfers who want physical therapy and Facebook for seminar help. <laughs> oh, here we go. Yeah. Okay. Advertising to reach golfers who want physical therapy. Okay. So the first thing we need to do is identify the golfer. This is what's really interesting. Karen, this is awesome, by the way. Yeah. Thank you for throwing this one out. Um, I think a lot of times what we do as marketers is we, we go, hey, golfers, are you interested in physical therapy? And the issue with the narrative-based relationship um, build is that that's too much up front. Um, there's, there's too many data points there, and it sounds too pitchy. And so one of the first things that I think you need to do is before you even start trying to approach your demo, find out where they are and who they are and how they engage. Um, so like a really good Golf Digest or magazine or, or uh, email list that you can purchase or rent or whatever. Um, and then once you know who they are, identify the one, two, or three pain points that you hear more often than anything else. So what are your common denominators? So a golfer might have like a, a tennis elbow type issue. And, uh, you know, at that point, create, create an article or, or a download or something that you can give away for free on the three ways to mitigate the risk of tennis elbow. And I, I know nothing about golf, so I'm probably sounding like a total idiot right now. But um, whatever issues they're running into, maybe it's like a, a bent knee problem. There's a way to mitigate that risk. There's nutritional supplements I'm not sure that they can take, like a close chondroitin is going to help with their joint pain. Um, there's probably ways that they can stretch and um, do things prior to their swing. Now, again, this isn't physical therapy yet, right? But it's golf and it's a golfer who has an issue that can be related back to physical therapy and if you create something out of this world something amazing it's 2,000 words it has imagery it has videos you've established yourself like as a thought leader in a way that nobody before you has I promise because if they had you'd know about them so when you create that content and they engage with that content that is a huge value add that's a huge value first and then after that when they engage with the content at the very end of the content you have a very soft ask and you say hey here's my lead magnet if you're interested in like you know the the, the um therapist's guide to golfing checklist download my lead magnet and then you can pixel on facebook and google and you re can, re can re retarget that lead magnet in perpetuity and then once you get them into your funnel because we're all infusionsoft gurus now you get to really have fun with them because now you get to test different offers and again it's all value first hey are you interested in this do you ever encounter that have you seen sometimes when you swing this way then it works that way Etc. Did I kind of answer your question? I got to catch up on this thread now. I got excited and stopped reading. Cool. Karen, how'd I do? Are you? Was that helpful? She chatted in. I can see it. You might be getting a delay. Yeah, that's probably what it is. Yeah. Renee says, or you could say something like, "Get an extra 100 yards in your drive with these simple stretches." There you go. Love that. Yeah, yeah. Renee. Great call more focused content Dennis okay. yeah that's you know uh, who was that Scott did something brilliant by the way um, if you're going after people who like golf Tiger Woods is not a golfer he's a celebrity so if you mm -hmm. try to target Tiger Woods and I think this is Molly Pittman from Digital Marketer brought that up Scott I don't know if that's where you got it but Molly said this too if you target Tiger Woods, you're going to get a bunch of people that like scandal and tabloids, right? <laughs> so you need to go find somebody that only golfers know. And that goes back to empathy. Don't do what you think your prospect does or wants to hear or whatever. Figure out who they are. Fall in love with them. And, and when you go fall in love with a golfer, you're going to find out a whole bunch of stuff that you never knew about golf. And then you use that to target and speak to them uh, in a contextually appropriate way. Guilty as charged. Scott, <laughs> respect, man. All I do is steal from digital marketers, so I'm, I'm all about it. Very cool. Guys, we have um, at least five more minutes. Is there any other questions? As long as we have the time, I'm really, really happy and really glad to kind of field some questions and get some dialogue going here. So is there anything else anyone wants to throw in there? Oh, the eighth principle. I, you know, it depends on how well my book sells. Um, just kidding. Uh, I didn't like Covey's, Covey's eighth principle, uh, which is weird because you know, the, the first seven principles sort of changed my life. But that whole help people find, find your voice thing, I, I truly do think that was a marketing play. I think that Franklin Covey was having financial issues, and they said, Stephen, please work your magic. Um, I, that sounds really combative, and I'm, 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 kind, of, I'm kind of throwing mud at, at one of my heroes here, but I, I wasn't a huge fan of 
of the book. I think the first, what, 80% of the book rehashed the first, this first seven principles. And then after that, it was just kind of like this ascension. And I think he touched upon that ascension in Sharpen the Saw. So his seventh principle is Sharpen the Saw. And to me, in a lot of ways, that really means like Kaizen, right? It's 1% improvement every day. Um, and so the eighth principle, I mean, it didn't even fit in the graphic. They had to make the graphic 3D and turn it around. So I thought that was a marketing gimmick. It didn't sound like him. I'm willing to bet that was a ghostwriter. Um, so I don't have a, a, you know, I mean, if this is incomplete and, and I get challenged later, then I would absolutely add to it. But um, I don't think I'm going to go that route, to be honest. I appreciate the, the question, though. Really good question. <laughs> what happened to those 20 yards on your drive? Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Scott, you're good at this, dude. Do I know you? <laughs> Scott actually just recently became certified. He came through our certification training not too long ago. Oh, we should be buddies, man. Look me up when you come to Icon. <laughs> oh, hey, is everybody coming to my breakout session? Tuesday at 6.15. I'm sure there's nowhere else you'd rather be. No, Scott. Oh. Okay, we'll be friends elsewhere. <laughs> I understand. Cool, guys. Okay, well, um, I guess last call for any questions at all. I think it's um, – I think – Kassim would really love the opportunity for you to pick his brain. <laughs> I just want to talk is all. I have that yeah. horrible, pathetic personality trait that enjoys the spotlight. No, I think uh, oh, Ramona's getting the book. There you go. Hey, thanks, Ramona. <laughs> Hell, if you can leave me a review, I would just love you forever. Uh, we were a bit stuck with the niche-ing. We thought first got insurance brokers didn't work out. Oh, this is something I'm struggling with, too. So funny. Um, they didn't seem to be too approachable. Then hotels. Okay, so I have, a, I have a comment for you, Kitty, only because we're having a hard time, too. This is going to sound a little arrogant. We kill it for every client we've ever had. So it's hard when you're, when, you're, when you're good with everybody to choose. God, that sounded horrible. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to approach it that way. I just got excited. It's hard for us to choose a specific vertical because you feel like you're cutting off opportunities for success. And one of the things that I got from a guy named Dennis Wu, um, and Dennis, I believe, is an ICP. I know he's, he's – uh, he is, because Matt Vosberg introduced me to him. Dennis, because I, I told Dennis, and he's brilliant. The guy's a genius. And I told him that exact same thing. I said, Dennis, really hard time choosing a vertical, but I know it's limiting my scale. Dennis said, go find a lighthouse client. So pick the client that you have that you love to death, that you want more of. Not just the client that you succeeded the most with, but the client that you actually really enjoy working with, that your staff enjoys working with, that respects what you do, that can scale, that has huge ascension opportunity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, great. And then he said, and this is the best part, and this is the part for you, Kitty. He said, if you don't have one yet, go get one. So before you choose your vertical, because committing to a vertical is marriage. I mean, you, you, you revamp your website, and you write all this copy and this content, and you change your LinkedIn page, and it's, it's just a, it's a big to-do. Find an industry that you like and start building a campaign for them. Find somebody, do it for free if you have to. If you go, you know what, I can really knock hotels out of the park. Find a hotel and say, look, this is who I am. This is what I want to do. This is my plan. I want to do a 90-day speculative campaign for you. If you pay for the ad spend, I won't charge you a dime for my time. Some people might disagree with that, by the way, but I think, again, this is value first. So if you can go to a hotel and say, this is what I want to do. I want to be the best digital marketer for hotels in the world. And I think I can do that. And, and here's how. And I'm going to run your campaign for you for 90 days. You pay for the ad spend. I'll do the work. Um, and then if you can knock that hotel out of the park, A, you just earned yourself a paying client. B, you just earned yourself the best case study in the whole wide world. And in my experience as an agency, case studies are the number one best performing lead magnet ever. So before you choose a vertical, make sure that you can perform in that vertical. And it's a really safe space. When you go to somebody and say, hey, this is spec. If you're willing to take a chance on me, I'm willing to take a chance on you. And you have, you have some room to make your mistakes. So you know, when, you're, when you're looking for a vertical, find somebody that you can really perform with.